Good morning and welcome to GHC's second pre-World Health Assembly webinar, uh, which will be a deeper dive into some of WHA's 72 agenda items. Uh, my name is Liz Colway and I manage external affairs for Global Health Council. Um, and I'll be walking you through a couple logistics and um, an overview of the agenda um, before we get started. Um, so I just want to remind you to please use the chat box to ask questions throughout the webinar. Uh, we have reserved some time at the end of the webinar for speakers to um, answer your questions. Uh, so please send your questions throughout the webinar so that we can um, populate them uh, for the Q&A session at the end. So we've dedicated time to speak about universal health coverage, uh, the global action plan to achieve SDG3, um, and to not overshadow the rest of the WHA agenda, we'll have a discussion on some other important um, items. Uh, these presentations will cover messaging around these topics um, and then also how to organize um, and optimize your advocacy efforts at WHA. So just a little bit about Global Health Council, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we are the leader membership organization supporting and connecting advocates, implementers, and stakeholders around global health priorities worldwide. Uh, we represent the collaborative voice of the community on key issues. We convene stakeholders around key priorities um, and actively engage with decision makers to influence global health policy. Um, and can learn more by visiting our website, www.globalhealth.org. So again, thank you for joining us um, this morning, early on a Friday morning, if you're based out of Washington, DC, uh, for participating in our WHA webinar series. Uh, please note that the webinar recordings and PowerPoint presentations will be available on our website a few days after the live session. Um, we did host a WHA webinar a couple weeks ago, um, uh, which was a bit of a preview and an overview of WHA. Um, and those slides and recording are available on our YouTube channel, and I'll be sending those links out after this webinar. Um, our final pre-WHA webinar will take place on May 10th at 9 a.m., and it will feature a few senior officials from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, Office for, of Global Affairs. Um, again, just some basic information on WHA. Um, the World Health Assembly will open on May uh, 20th and will close the following Tuesday, um, May 28th. Um, and official pr proceedings do uh, take place in the Palais uh, and with unofficial side events and meetings going on um, around those grounds. Um, again, you can access all important WHA documentation, including the agenda, which we're addressing today, on um, WHA's, uh, WHA, or WHO's WHA 72 web portal. Um, and in, um, along with the agenda, you'll find also documents to um, uh, other uh, supporting, uh, supporting documents to other agenda items. Um, and WHO does release a preliminary journal um, usually about a week or a few days before the start of the assembly, um, and that will include any changes to the agenda along with other um, technical brief, uh, briefings and official side uh, events taking place. A little more on these official events. Um, technical briefings, again, will be published in the preliminary journal. Um, the member state meetings have actually just been released uh, last week, and a link uh, to those side events can be found. Again, um, I will share this uh, slide deck with you after the presentation. Um, there's also non-state actor side events uh, that take place during the week in the evening, and again, those, uh, that list is also now public. Um, I did want to bring up some of GHC side events, which I know we'll get into a little bit more during the presentation. Um, but we will be hosting a few side events um, with uh, some of our partners and members throughout the week, um, specifically on uh, the Global Action Plan um, on UHC uh, specifically. If you or your organization is hosting an event throughout the week, we do encourage you to send them to us at events at globalhealth.org. Uh, we are populating a, a calendar of side events that is hosted online on our website. Um, we do try to update this with public events 
um, as soon as we get them. Although I know a number of other organizations are also populating their own calendars, um, but we do try to um, keep this to health related events of our members and partners. Last but not least, I wanted to mention that GHC is sending a member delegation to WHA. If you are an organizational member, you can apply to send up to two, uh, two to four representatives from your organization. Um, our detailed policy can be found online um, and the deadline to apply is April 30th. Um, so please review that information online. And with that, I want to hand it over to our first speaker, who's going to be um, talking through uh, universal health coverage on the WHA agenda, um, who is Eliana, who is the coordinator of the coordinating uh, the Civil Society um, Engagement Mechanism for UHC 2030. So over to you, Eliana. Thank you so much. Hi again, my name is Eliana Monteforte. Um, I work for Management Sciences for Health, which right now um, is the secretariat for the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism. And within the CSEM, I uh, coordinate the, the mechanism. Next slide, please. Great. So before I go into all of the exciting activities that we've been doing and advocacy, I do want to make sure everybody's clear about what UHC 2030 is and how the civil society engagement mechanism fits in. Um, I have about 10 minutes, so I may not be able to go through all of what's on these slides, but when you receive the slides, you'll see that we actually have some links um, at the very top where you can click and go to the websites and get more information than what's on the slides. So I encourage you to do that when you receive them. Um, so about UHC 2030, so overall UHC 2030 is a multi-stakeholder platform um, that works to increase political commitment toward universal health coverage. Um, it works with various different multi-stakeholders, so it, and we can go into that a little bit later, um, but really it's, it's a way for UHC 2030 to get countries to really commit to UHC um, and to make sure that they're providing funding and commitments and that they're being held accountable for those commitments afterwards. Um, so they do various different activities under that mandate. Um, they improve coordination of health system strengthening efforts, strengthening multi-stakeholder policy dialogues and coordination, again, facilitating accountability for progress towards health system strengthening in UHC, building political momentum, as I said, is a really big um, part of their mandate. Um, and then advocating for sufficient, appropriate, and well-coordinating resource allocation for health system strengthening. Um, they do a lot more, so again, I encourage you to go on their website and see some of their individual technical working groups that focus on different technical areas that might be of interest to you. Next slide. So they do have a governing board that's called the Steering Committee, and it's made up of about 20 members. Um, you can see that they're made up of nine country seats, three multilateral organizations. The World Bank and the WHO hosts UHC 2030, so they each have one seat on the Steering Committee. There's a philanthropic organization and then three civil society, active civil society members and alternates three extra alternates in case the active ones can't make it to the steering committee meetings. And those actually come from our civil society engagement mechanism. And then one seat for private sector. Um, historically, they have about 66 um, existing members having gone into uh, UHC 2030. So UHC 2030s actually comes from an existing platform um, that was the, inter -health, in, in the health partnership and they, it basically evolved into UHC 2030. And so coming into that, um, they came with 66 existing partners. Now they have grown to about 130 partners, which um, include international organizations, foundations, CSOs, and private sector. And from those 130, um, there are about 80 countries now that have joined the UHC 2030 initiative. Um, if you're interested in joining after you learn more about UHC 2030, you're welcome to click on the link that at the very bottom to join the Global Compact. It's quite a long process, um, but uh, if you follow the instructions, you can easily go through it and um, become a member of, of UHC 2030. Next slide. Great. Um, so about the civil society engagement mechanism, so you have the link to the website there. I highly encourage people who don't know about the CSCM to go on our website and 
um, learn more about it. And if you're a civil society organization and you're interested in joining, it's a very easy process. You can just click join and it's a quick um, survey monkey that you submit and then we would just review it and um, we'll add you as a member. Um, the civil society engagement mechanism, um, their main ma or our main mandate is to raise civil society voices in this entire UHC 2030 movement. Um, we're basically the civil society arm of UHC 2030. Um, and so what we do is we ensure UHC poli uh, policies are inclusive and equitable and um, that no one is left behind. That's one of the main um, advocacy statements that you'll see a lot around the CSCM. Um, as you know, civil society works closest with those most vulnerable, marginalized populations in different parts of the world. So really it's our responsibility to ensure that those populations aren't being left behind as UHC 2030 and in the entire UHC movement um, moves towards UHC. So that's one of our biggest mandates. There are various activities that we do um, to influence policy design and implementation. Um, lobbying for participatory and inclusive policy development and implementation processes. We do a lot at the country level, um, especially in this year, and I'll talk about it more with strengthening citizen-led social accountability mechanisms. Um, promoting coordination between CSO platforms is important, and then knowledge creation um, at the national and global level. And our platform, our website is a really great platform to really kind of serve as a knowledge exchange platform for civil society to learn more about UHC and how they can participate in it at the country, regional and global level. Next slide. So we also have a kind of governing board. It's called the advisory group. There are about 18 members and they're mostly responsible for the technical, the design and implementation of a lot of the technical advocacy activities and representation that you'll see around the CSEM. Um, if you wanna learn more about what they do and who they are, um, please feel free to click on the 18 members link. And then aside from this, um, advisory group, we also have a membership of, at this point, over 560 individuals from over 250 organizations from over 50 countries, probably more than that at this point. We grow every week. Um, again, if you want to join, there's our um, website. You can follow us on Twitter and you can also just reach us at cscm at msh.org if you're interested in finding more information or have questions. Next slide. Great, so one of the main events that's coming up um, is the high-level meeting on universal health coverage, um, which is happening at um, the United Nations General Assembly in, on September 23rd. Um, in the lead up to that, as many of you probably know, on April 29th, there's going to be a hearing um, for the high-level meeting on UHC where CSCM will be participating. Um, in advance of the hearing, the CSCM felt it was really important that we have our own priority actions, that we, as the civil society engagement mechanism, um, our members and just civil society even outside of CSCM can use to advocate, um, advocate for at the hearing and then also in the lead up to the actual high level meeting on UHC in September. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about where these four priority actions came from. Um, just so you know, we launched them a few weeks ago and we um, have also been promoting them recently this week online through our newsletter website and you'll probably see it on Twitter too if you start following us. Um, but we worked with about 300 civil society organizations through face-to-face -face civil society consultations and also a survey to really get people's inputs from civil society on what they want to see as an outcome of the high-level meeting on UHC and what are some of those commitments that they really want to see coming out of the high-level meeting on UHC. And so based on all of that feedback that we received from civil society, we developed this um, uh, uh, civil society priority actions document. Um, this is basically a summary of the four priority actions that we go into detail in the document. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time to go into detail um, on these, these four, but the first is increase in public health financing and financial protection. Um, the second is leave no one behind, reach first those left behind as committed to in the SDGs. 
And then we have another priority action focused on health workers. Paid and unpaid was a really big emphasis um, that civil society wanted to make. And also um, investing in the growth of the health force and engaging civil society and community and UHC implementation to ensure accountability. Um, the main thing that I do want to highlight here is you will also see that UHC 2030 um, released its key asks for the high-level meeting on UHC. Um, a lot of the inputs that we received in our face-to-face -to -face consultation and survey actually went into those UHC 2030 key asks. Um, they also reached out to various other multi um, lateral stakeholders to get inputs for their key asks and that really represents the key ask for the entire UHC 2030 movement and we're very much in support of that. Um, civil society wanted to have its own voice and go into more detail in some of the asks that they had so we developed this priority actions document but it very much complements the UHC 2030 key asks and is in support of them um, and so we use both of them in all of the advocacy um, at the hearing and then in the lead up to the high level meeting and we really encourage other civil society to do the same. Next slide please. So in addition to the work that we're going to be doing um, in the lead up to the high level meeting on UHC, um, as many of you know there was a primary health care conference in Astana um, and we were a part of that and actually put together a civil society statement for what we would like to see um, come out of the global, global primary health care conference and also you know what we want our civil society to advocate for um, in all of the activities, the advocacy activities that are happening around the world revolved around, revolving around PHC. Um, as you know, primary health care is also an important part of probably what's going to be discussed at the high-level meeting on UHC, so we felt the statement would go beyond just Astana and um, Health Civil Society, you know, use some of our advocacy points in this statement to also incorporate them in their um, advocacy for the high-level meeting and beyond. Um, this statement was developed um, with inputs from about 190 civil society members. Um, they call the statement itself calls on governments to strengthen leadership and governance. Um, so mostly focused on developing and implementing costed strategies and plans for how they're going to achieve the primary health care goals, um, facilitating um, coordination among the different ministries of health um, related to education, health, nutrition, and water, um, setting um, quality of care safety standards is another one. Um, under improving financing, obviously increasing public financing for um, primary health care is a big one. Eliminating out-of-pocket payments is another one. And you will see some overlaps in some of these PHC advocacy calls to action with our um, um, high-level meeting priority actions document. Um, enhancing accountability is another big one. Improving the quality of data to measure the performance of primary health care. Um, making priority set, setting processes, policies, implementation, implementation strategies, budgets and ex, expenditures transparent. That's another very big one that came out of that. Um, and then, of course, we also call on development partners to um, advance country-led solutions. So promote approaches to reduce health inequities, support community-based programs, um, so all of that is incorporated in the statement as well as many other things, so I encourage you all to click on the link and read that. And at WHA, you're really going to see the CSCM advocate for what you're going to read in the Priority Actions document as well as in the primary health uh, coverage statement that we created. Next slide. I think that's it for the slides. Okay, and then the other, just I know I went slightly over, but um, the other request that I was given was to talk a little bit about what some of the um, upcoming events um, for UHC will be and also what we're planning on doing at WHA. So I would say aside from this high level, this hearing on the high level meeting on UHC, which is a really important event for us, WHA is gonna be the other big one. Um, at WHA, we are right now working with Save the Children um, to organize an official event uh, that's going to be focused on action and accountability on UHC, building political momentum toward the UN high-level meeting. Um, this will be a really important meeting for us. One of our activities in the lead-up to the high-level meeting is 
doing um, country level advocacy meetings in 14 countries where we're going to share the priority actions documents with um, different uh, civil society in these 14 countries and um, have a meeting where they can engage in government and the real the goals for that is really to get government number one to attend the uh, high level meeting the second goal is to make sure that they're committing to uhc gaps that they're seeing at the country level which is what they discuss in this uh, meeting and then the third is really for them to work with governments on holding them accountable afterwards for those commitments that they make and so the experiences that are coming through that meeting um, will be um will be presented in the save the children um session that you'll you'll see. I know UHC 2030 is also organizing a lot of sessions that right now are TBD, so they asked me not quite to share yet, um, but they're going to revolve around good governance, um, good governance and multi-sectorial actions for UHC. Um, they're going to be doing some um, UHC coverage to deliver global strategy on women, children, and adolescents' health. Um, <clears throat> and also action and accountability on UHC. They're going to be supporting our um, building momentums toward the UN high-level meeting. Um, and then I'm pretty sure that they're going to also have um, probably a private sector event um, that they're going to be supporting as well, revolving around um, private sector and um, UHC. So with that, I will give the mic back to Liz. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Eliana. Um, and we are gonna take some questions at the end of the, the presentation, but I do know that um, Lois Pace, our President and Executive Director, did have a quick question for you right now. Thanks for indulging me, Liz, I appreciate that. And Eliana, yes, I, we appreciate your presentation um, and, and reviewing the various <clears throat> ask and events. Um, it's our understanding that there are also a number of resolutions on deck following the executive board meeting related to um, community health workforce, um, as well as primary health care and the high level meeting. So um, would your, uh, I guess, um, call to action for this group be to use these particular asks and principles that you've presented um, in our conversations with uh, governments with regards to those resolutions yeah. so that they can reflect these asks? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. Thank you so much for bringing it up. And that is really what we're aiming for in disseminating the priority actions um, for the high-level meeting, which you'll see that we do have a, um, a priority action focused on development of the workforce that we go into more detail in the document, so please read that. And then also, um, that's re really what the calls to action for the primary healthcare conference um, are too. We really wanted it to go beyond the conference and really want civil society to take these and, you know, these big WHA moments, use them to do their advocacy, and not just really internationally, but also doing it at the country and the regional level as well, um, and those that might come up, those events that might come up at those levels. Great, thanks very much for that response. I wanted to be sure people really connected the dots on that. Yeah, thanks. And with that, um, I think that I am next on deck. Uh, so uh, appreciate again, everyone for joining us this morning. This is Lois Pace with the Global Health Council. And I'll be talking about something that um, people might not have heard as much about or really have an understanding of, but will also be sort of in the background, if not um, in the forefront uh, at the World Health Assembly this year. Uh, it's around this uh, idea of a global action plan, and um, I'll provide some more background in the, in the forthcoming slides, but essentially this plan um, or this initiative um, was sort of launched at the World Health Summit uh, last October um, at the behest of a few uh, uh, member states or, or, or leaders of, of a few countries. Um, and the intention was to encourage not just WHO, but the multiple agencies, um, international agencies that focus on global health to truly come together and coordinate um, around uh, a sort of common global health agenda. We recognize that through the SDG process, um, there was an attempt to sort of coalesce the various global health goals uh, and have a greater appreciation for how um, sort of intertwined they truly are, uh, and in turn, uh, really encourage stakeholders um, to work collaboratively uh, to reach those. And so this initiative is, I think, an attempt to, to model that aspiration and to really implement um, that aspiration in an important way. 
as you can see from the slide in front of you, uh, there's a list of the 12 uh, global health and development agencies that are included in this, this GAP uh, initiative who have already begun and been working uh, since October uh, towards a, a part of this particular plan. And we will be able to receive some additional updates um, from the Secretariat for the GAP, the, the, lead, uh, the leads on some of those activities when we all come together in May. But there have been some additional uh, updates throughout the year that we wanted to make sure people were aware of. So next slide, please. So again, this is a little bit more background on uh, the gap uh, and the impetus for the Global Action Plan. Um, you'll see from the second bullet that it's really meant to amplify um, and enhance the work that we do collectively. In other words, we, we can be stronger together. And so instead of solely looking at, say, the Global Fund or Gavi or WHO as separate institutions who need to work alone um, towards their various health objectives, I think the question is what sort of framework or strategy can be pulled together uh, to, uh, to leverage uh, their respective resources and technical capacity and other assets um, so that they can be that much more effective in their core work and also uh, around, again, um, a joint uh, global health goal. I, I do want to add um, that a civil society advisory group was stood up earlier this year in an effort to ensure those activities and conversations truly do incorporate um, the voices and input of civil society. And the next slide, I believe, uh, will show sort of um, a bit more on the objectives of that group, as well as who's included in that group. It includes a number of members from around the world. Uh, it's fairly evenly split between um, uh, genders and uh, as well as uh, the global north and south actually I think that there are five uh, members who represent countries in the global south. Um, there are a range of issues that each of the members sort of covers or otherwise focuses on in his or her day to day um, and so there was a, an, a, an effort to, to truly make this representative uh, at least uh, recognizing that um, it's not yet um, a broad uh, civil society network of sorts but I uh, just as we've seen in other models, such as the, the Global Financing Facility, uh, and as well as UHC um, and the CSCM process, um, there is an opportunity to further expand this group as we continue to learn uh, both what the gap is and understand civil society's role in engaging with that. Um, I'll move forward from this slide, but, uh, but just so everyone is aware, this information is available online on the CSCM website as well. And I should mention that the CSCM uh, has uh, been able to host uh, and help stand up the Civil Society Advisory Group on behalf of the, of the Global Action Plan and the Secretariat. So grateful for their support there. I think I'll skip this slide because it um, goes into a bit more detail on how the gap was set up, but I'd like to get into sort of exactly what they will do in the interest of time. So this is a framework that you would find online on the, on the website for the Global Action Plan. They have three, um, I guess, commitments um, or objectives, uh, align, accelerate, and account. Uh, and as you can see, uh, they are emphasizing this effort to coordinate their uh, their, their various activities, um, but not just for the sake of coming together, for the sake of truly accelerating um, their work and finding innovative ways to uh, achieve their objectives. And I would argue broadly this, this uh, goal of UHC um, in addition to, again, the, the health-related SDGs. And they want to uh, very much ensure that there is an accountability framework um, beside this. Uh, and so not solely a commitment, but uh, an outline of metrics and objectives that arguably we as civil society could also play a role in monitoring um, once uh, this framework uh, or plan is implemented. With that, I want to get into the timing. Um, oh, sorry, I, I will I will review this slide as well. Excuse me to to explain that um, the way that their work is organized is in these seven accelerators, they call them. And so there's some cross-cutting efforts that um, the 12 agencies have identified 
as key areas where they can really uh, sort of test um, or fulfill these objectives. Uh, and you'll see um, that they range from, you know, financing to service delivery to, to R&D and innovation. Uh, and so there's an attempt to, to um, sort of touch upon uh, the various aspects of their respective work. And again, kind of look into in each of these, um, these particular um, uh, silos or accelerators to really understand how they can best uh, align, accelerate, and account. You'll see from the third accelerator that there is also a focus on um, communities and civil society. Um, however, our recommendation uh, already as uh, an advisory group uh, has been to ensure that there is a focus on civil society throughout the various accelerators and not just on this one pillar. Next slide, please. So, uh, here is the timeline that I was mentioning earlier, just so people understand where we are in this process or, or where they are in this process, I should say. Um, there has been, a, as I mentioned, sort of a phase one, which was really just to um, kind of get the, the plan off the ground to, to sort of launch this idea of what it would mean to um, bring these agencies together and, and who we're referring to by these agencies and again, what what they're, they're aiming to do. And so in the second phase, um, they have, uh, been able to really provide um, a bit more detail around, for example, each of these accelerators, you will find concept papers or thought papers, maybe I should say, um, on their website that explain some of their, um, their thinking um, around each of those uh, priority areas and their approach um, collectively as agencies towards um, coordinating in those in those spaces. Uh, I, would, I would say that phase two has also involved, again, the standing up of the civil society advisory group um, but but I would I would like to call your attention to phase three because really um, phase two is quite short as you can see from this timeline and um, I, I would say that the secretariat and um, several of the agencies have work have been working um, um, to towards uh, this this end goal uh, of releasing a report instead of recommendations or perhaps I should say a, a, a framework or actual plan at the high level meeting in September. In order for them to be able to do so, um, their work essentially ends um, sometime in June so that they can turn around um, um, sort of the final details of that report and, and the translation of that report, um, which means that um, there isn't a lot of, uh, of opportunity for us to um, participate in this process um, over the, the next, given that it's only been a couple, there are only a, a few months remaining um, in this phase, but again, civil society is working to do what we can to ensure that we do have um, robust input over the next couple of months, given the shortened timeline. Um, I'll say there, there uh, will be receiving some additional updates on where the various agencies are um, next week in New York. Um, I think there is a, still a, quite a bit of work um, pending um, on their end that I think we're all anxious to, to hear back about, um, but I trust that, again, they continue to work um, towards some of those deliverables and um, identifying ways that we can best support them in those deliverables. But I just wanted to say for the purposes of this webinar that um, it's not that we've missed very much. I think that it's still very very much a work in progress and our goal um, is even beyond this phase to ensure that civil society has an expanded role in the implementation of the plan. And so given um, 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 the, the, the timeline that we're in, we uh, as a group had identified various convenings where we could at least receive updates in the global action plan. Uh, that has happened, for example, at the recent AMREF conference, and as I mentioned, will happen next week in New York at the UHC meeting. Um, in addition to having um, conversations at World Health Assembly and potentially at Women Deliver and G20. So we're doing what we can as, as an advisory group to um, insert civil society into this process. Uh, and in addition to those uh, in-person <laughs> engagements, uh, we are hoping to also have um, additional online opportunities for people to make contributions. Um, the CSEM actually circulated a survey the end of last year around the Global Action Plan, which you all might have seen and contributed to. Um, we are using this webinar as an opportunity to provide an update and, and perhaps can plan an additional webinar. And um, the Secretariat has mentioned um, potentially um, opening up the recommendations that come out of next week for comment by the broad 
broader community, and that's obviously something we're encouraging. In addition to all of that, each um, various countries are um, propping up consultations as well, and so we're hoping that that provides an additional opportunity for civil society at a local level, which is critically important to be involved in this process and to have this whole initiative be more owned um, at the country level and not just at the global level. So um, just as I wrap up here, I just want to highlight what we can do as civil society. As I said, you know, we really want people to be engaged in these few moments that we have identified um, to, to be involved. And we are, are, are doing our best to ensure that feels meaningful for people, but I think are open to how you all feel that can be enhanced um, like through either um, in person or online. Um, as has already, or as will be mentioned later, we do have a, an, an additional event um, in at the World Health Assembly that we're hoping people can join either in person or on, or online because that will be live streamed. Um, at recognizing that the event next week in New York has been somewhat limited, but again, we are hoping to um, also make some of that information available to everyone as well. And the next uh, slide is more really on what we'd like governments to do. And, and um, we do want governments to be aware of this initiative and then also um, actively engage in it themselves by uh, hosting their own consultations, uh, given sort of the, the huge effort uh, that's, that's, that's involved um, with this particular undertaking. It's no, it's no small undertaking to try and bring these various agencies um, together. Uh, and again, um, this will be likely be part of the conversations um, at WHA and before and after. And so it's something that we felt you all needed to be aware of and to the extent that we as a community can help support or otherwise promote this type of coordination in pursuit of UHC um, or other global health goals, then we absolutely want to do that. And so if you have other sort of thoughts or considerations for governments uh, in terms of our asks, I think we welcome those in the chat box as well. But with that, I think I'll, I'll wrap up so that we can keep it moving. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lois, for that introduction to the gap and offering some additional ways that we can get engaged. Um, and like Lois mentioned, feel free to share your questions and comments in the chat box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Uh, but now I'm gonna move to um, Jamie Bainishi, who's the director of the Global Health Technologies Coalition and also serves as the co-chair of the GHC Multilateral Roundtable, who's gonna um, really address what's uh, beyond G or UHC on the agenda. Um, so over to you, Jamie. Great, thanks and um, thanks everyone for taking the time to, to chat today. Um, so looking specifically at WHA 72, we're coming up just less than a month away um, again, you know, UHC is probably the, the number one thing, uh, the hottest topic that may be discussed and getting a lot of momentum this year, but we thought it would be important to also take a few minutes and just look at sort of what else is going on at WHA, what else is on the agenda. Um, next slide. Before I dive into the actual agenda, I think it's important for all of us to take a step back and realize this is going to be a pretty big year and bu busy time this WHA for WHO staff. Um, Dr. Tedros announced earlier this year a massive reorganization of the organization. Uh, so you'll see a, just a quick chart of what that looks like here. And as we have been trying to track and understand kind of where are the moving pieces, how are teams changing, um, there's still a little bit of uncertainty there. And this is a, a very much a work in progress. So just think it's important to take a step back and keep this in mind as you go into WHA that there's a lot of transitions happening. Um, it's particularly chaotic um, and, and it makes it a, perhaps a little bit more challenging as well as we set bilateral meetings and have other engagements with WHO staff. Um, just again, keep that in mind. Um, next slide. So looking at the agenda, um, often you'll see as you look at the formal agenda, there's a breakdown of what's happening in committee room B versus committee room A. Um, in committee room B this year, you'll see the biggest topic I would I would imagine, other than some of the reorganization details, is WHO's funding situation. Uh, many are aware that WHO is working on a massive resource mobilization effort as it looks towards its future, and um, that is probably one of the biggest things in terms of the procedural um, topics, in terms of the core WHO business. Um, I just put a snapshot in here as an illustrative example of the the current 2018 to 2019 biennium budget. 
often we see polio and hear about polio funding um, going away or what happens after you eradicate polio. And I think it's important to think about some of these issues and, and this will also be important to think about as we look at the agenda um, because that is such a huge chunk of WHO's funding. Next slide. Okay, so getting into the meat of it, this is where a lot of the action is happening during WHA week. Um, committee room A, specifically the strategic priority matters. This is where most of the resolutions will be introduced on these topics and a lot of the debate will, hap will happen. Of course, with the ongoing health crisis in DRC, public health emergencies, preparedness and response will be at the top of the list. Um, again, polio, as this has been a longtime priority of WHO in terms of looking at polio eradication and transition. And then again, I think probably part of the discussion will focus on what are the funding elements associated with that and, and how is polio funding supported? Lots of different activities cross-cutting at WHO. Um, Im implementation of 2030 agenda and UHD, I think we've already covered in this webinar, so I don't think much more needs to be said there. Um, Obviously, climate change and health, again, I think there's a, an increased uh, momentum within WHO to look at cross-sector dialogue and how different sectors come together on certain issues. So a lot there with health and environment and climate change. And access to medicines, this has been an area that's been uh, hotly debated for many years and will continue to be. This is where I would imagine a lot of the most contentious debate will happen between member states on the floor of the WHA. Um, a lot of disagreement and a lot of discussion happened at the EB uh, earlier this year around access, uh, access and affordability of medicines is a big part of this. Um, you'll see, I think, the U.S. delegation, Brazil, India, others, um, very, very, very involved here. Um, again, I'm going to, for the sake of time, not get into too much detail but just highlighting that this may be an area that takes up a lot of time on the on the agenda. And I think as Liz pointed out, it's really important to look at the agenda day to day because some of these items move faster, some of these items move slower. Uh, sometimes the agenda goes long and people stay later in the evening to, to finish an agenda item or the member states do. Um, so just to keep that in mind that, that some of these things, depending on how heated the discussions are, how much back and forth there is, how much engagement by member states, um, tends to sort of adjust what the, the agenda on a day-to-day -day basis looks like. Um, and then, of course, it's really important to note that there's also the follow-up to the high-level meetings uh, from the last few UN General Assembly. So specifically, what are WHO and member state commitments related to AMR, NCDs, and TB? And how do member states leverage this particular WHA uh, to advance commitments on those topics? Next slide. I think it's important to also call out that there's other technical matters on the agenda. So again, the, the, the last slide was focused on the strate strategic priority matters, again, where a lot of the resolutions are being introduced, but other technical matters will also be discussed that are, that are priority to member states. Certainly, there's a global interest in influenza um, from an R&D community. There's a lot of interest in, is there a, a universal flu vaccine? It's something we talk about in the United States, but it's truly a global issue. Um, again, falsified medical products, human resources for health, promoting health for refugees and migrants, patient safety, smallpox eradication, internal classification of diseases, global strategy for women's, children's, and adolescents' health, emergency and trauma care, and then public health implications of the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. This is something we're watching with interest because it focuses on sharing of biological samples and what our country agreements um, going to look like when you're thinking about sharing flu strains or, you know, as we think about the ongoing Ebola crisis, infectious disease samples, um, how does that transfer across borders? How are those, those samples shared? Next slide. Again, moving very, very quickly through the agenda here. Um, so how do we as advocates engage and on these issues? We know the member states will be introducing resolutions um, They'll be making their statements. We as civil society, if you're accredited to participate in WHA, have the opportunity to weigh in as well. Um, so a recommendation as, as someone, as an organization, GHTC, that participates as part of the Global Health Council's delegation, be sure to carefully review the agenda. Again, I just give you the summary, the highlights there. 
Um, identify the topics that are most relevant to your organization and draft preliminary statements. I'll say as a global health R&D focused organization, we care a lot about a lot of the issues on this agenda, but we also realize it's probably not appropriate to talk about every single one of them or make a statement on every single one of them. So, you know, I would encourage all, all groups on the call who are participating in WHA to think about what are the core, you know, two or three or maximum, maybe four areas that are going to be most, most relevant and most salient to what you're working on. Um, collaboration is also really important. Um, so looking for common ground with other organizations in advance of WHA, and I've got an arrow there pointing down to the staff of the Global Health Council. Um, we found that coordination and collaboration with GHG is key. Um, it's really helpful to have them taking all of the input from all of the different interests and stakeholders going into WHA and as part of their delegation, um, where we can see, okay, a lot of folks care about uh, women's and children's issues. A lot of folks care about health preparedness. How do we make sure that we can come together as a community and have one concise statement um, or a couple of concise statements that touch on all the issues we care about, but that we're coming together truly as a global health civil society community. So can't stress enough the important role that GHC plays in all of this. Um, and again, I mentioned it before and Liz mentioned it, but track that agenda closely. Um, there's nothing more stressful than being in some other part of Geneva and then figuring out that your item is coming up on the agenda and you're not anywhere near the Palais or in the right part of the Palais, which is a big, big campus. Um, so do, you know, whether it's following on the live stream, um, which they do, or just looking for updates of, of what's happening every morning, um, be sure to track that agenda closely to, to ensure that you don't miss um, the, the agenda items that are most relevant to you. Um, and then social media, I think WHA is a really, really big week to share your thought leadership, to care the issues you care about. Um, there's a lot of momentum, there's a lot of energy, and you have a lot of focus of the global health community, the truly global health community during this week. Um, so be sure to share, you know, any statements, any activities on social media and, you know, um, re encourage partners and other organizations to retweet. And I'm sure, again, um, Danielle and the GHC team will say a little bit more about this as they finalize the preparations and coordinating everyone going into WHA. Next slide. I think it's also important to think about how can WHA week be leveraged to advance advocacy goals? Um, so it's an incredibly busy week. Everyone is scrambling. Folks are running all over town. Wear comfortable shoes. Uh, I don't think that can be said enough times either. <laughs> People are running back and forth between hotels and meeting spaces, internal and external to the Palais. Um, but I will also say that as we, as advocates um, going into WHA, have better access to a lot of government officials than we would ever have here in Washington or in other places. And so this is a really, again, busy, sometimes scheduling is tough, but probably one of the best opportunities of the year to engage in bilateral meetings with, with relevant stakeholders. Um, you'll see that I have a picture here on the right. Um, that is the Serpentine, basically a cafe and lounge space in the Palais. I, this is the place to be. Um, this is often where a lot of the meetings, a lot of the negotiations, a lot of the behind the scenes work um, outside of the committee rooms happens. And so this is this is where you want to be. If you haven't been to WHA before, you will be spending a lot of time in this area. Um, and then, you know, again, it's it's beyond the government officials and stakeholders who are going to be there. This is a great chance as well to connect with counterpart advocates from other countries. It's a great chance to say, who cares about my my issue um, in other parts of the world? How can we get together? How can we connect in person? Um, so, you know, obviously chasing government officials and WHA staff is, is important and helpful, but, but please don't also forget the other um, advocates, the other, the other stakeholders who, who might be able to help to strengthen your advocacy who are there. Um, and then uh, both of our previous presenters have mentioned side events. Uh, these are also fantastic networking opportunities. So, of course, sharing the substance of UHC. I think a lot of these side events this year are going to be focused on UHC. Um, but it's also a great chance to, to meet and connect with, with all the different stakeholders I've just mentioned. So I think I'll stop there in the interest of time. Um, can always circle back on specific agenda items if there's any questions, but I want to make sure Danielle has enough time to get into the nitty gritty of statements and, and what's coming up. 
Great, thank you so much, Jamie, for that additional intel and then also those very useful uh, tips and tricks to navigate the very uh, busy week. Um, so like you met, just mentioned, I'm gonna hand the, the mic now over to Danielle Heiberg, who uh, manages uh, GHG's advocacy efforts, and she'll be going into a little bit more detail on um, submitting statements uh, to be read on the ground of uh, WHA. Sorry about that, I forgot to unmute myself. Thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Since we are running a little bit short on time, I'm going to make this rather quick. Um, you see some rather wordy slides here with a process on how GHC manages our statement process. Because we do have a number of delegates joining us every year that represent different organizations and have different priorities for the various agenda items, and we can only submit one agenda, or excuse me, one statement per agenda item, it does make it a little bit tricky for us. So what we do is we um, have sent out an initial interest survey that we have asked organizations attending on our delegation to fill out. This is an opportunity for you to indicate which statements um, you're interested in working on. And when that uh, interest survey closes on Friday, May 3rd, we will then connect all of the uh, organizations that are interested in working on the same statement so that you can draft the statements together. This makes the process a little bit easier um, because you can work out early on the key priorities that every organization wants to highlight and um, be able to get those uh, priorities in the statements, which as we all know are rather short, they're only 300 words, so it can be rather difficult to sometimes to um, be uh, succinct and to get all of our points across. Next slide, please. Um, Again, some important reminders about this. The statements do have to address a particular agenda item and do have to align with GHC's mission, vision, and values. We do read through all of the um, final drafts once they are completed and, and before we submit to WHA. And then the second um, point that we always like to remind folks of is that in order for your statement to be considered part of the official record, um, it does have to be read from the floor, which means that either you or another representative from an organization to help who helped to draft the statement um, does need to be following the floor uh, proceedings quite closely to make sure that you're present to read the statement when um, the non-state actor uh, statement portion of each agenda item does come up. We um, usually do tend to run into a little bit of difficulty with this towards the end of the week, as I know a lot of um, people don't always stay in Geneva um, in the later part of the week. Um, I will be in Geneva until Saturday evening, so we'll be available to um, make sure that we do get some of those statements that are read, that need to be read on Friday and Saturday as well. So um, I, if you are planning on submitting a statement, I am in contact with you throughout the week to make sure you're aware of when agenda items are coming up. And if you leave Geneva, you need to let me know so I can make sure that we do have someone to fill in. Um, and finally, um, I do want to say that we, GHC, has highlighted Agenda Item 18.1, which does focus on the WHO reform process, as something that we do want to make sure that we make a statement on, because this is um, a bit of a document to, to wade through, and we, um, we recognize that there might be a number of different angles that we would our members would be interested in um, on this agenda item. We will be coordinating the statement for that and, and taking the lead on it. If you are interested in providing input on that, we will be sending out a survey to our members uh, next week to solicit some feedback on um, key points and priorities that we do want to raise in that. So if you are interested in that, please do keep an eye out for that survey. I think that's it for me. So back to Liz. Great. Thanks again, Danielle. Um, and now we're going to just open it up to some uh, Q&A. Um, I know we received a few questions um, earlier on in the webinar, so if you do have any uh, that cover uh, any of the three or four presentations we've had today, um, please uh, do share those questions in the chat box. Um, and I think I might first 
turn it over to Lois. There were a couple questions uh, regarding the Global Action Plan um, specifically. So um, I, I'm gonna bring those questions up and ask her. So I don't know if there are some additional questions, but I appreciated the ones that we did receive. Um, you all should have received um, responses to those real time um, in the chat box when I went ahead and shared with the full group uh, around um, mental health being a part of the gap. Uh, and, um, and my response was uh, that the accelerators are not broken down by disease, um, but, but rather uh, these other core areas um, that I mentioned, and that's done purposely so that the um, work can be seen as more cross-cutting. Um, I think the question is quite relevant, though, because I'm sure people have that question around a number of different disease areas. And so, um, you know, I think um, uh, the various actors wanted to honor the fact that there's certain groups who are sort of charged with specific disease areas, like immunization, like HIV, TB, malaria, um, of course, there isn't an agency um, um, aside from WHO focused on mental health, but I think we acknowledge that WHO does have a, a an NCD uh, 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 a cluster um, and and other activities that incorporate that work and so I think that the the disease work and the specifics around that stays sort of separate and with the various agencies but um, but the way you can see them coming together is around those areas like um, service delivery or primary care financing and the, and research and the like um, the other questions were a bit more um, specific that I that I did see um, um, uh, there was a repeat question that we had gotten last time around the engagement of individuals, and, and I'll, I'll reiterate that. Um, I think from GHC's perspective, we welcome um, advocates as part of our network and people who um, want to be say abreast of things through our online platforms and so that's something that I think people find valuable. You'll receive a lot of updates through that. Um, and uh, in addition, I think being ready for um, or keeping an ear open for in-country opportunities. Um, again, it's something that we are pr um, promoting or encouraging at the global level, countries do in terms of consultations and sub-society engagement. We recognize that that's not always as um, prevalent or, or transparent as we'd like, but it's something that we will continue to push globally. I think it's something that um, people who um, work in different countries can be pushing on their end as well uh, in order to engage. Hopefully that's helpful. Great, thanks so much, Lois. And I know we are at time. Um, we did receive a couple uh, more logistical questions on um, some documents that will be released uh, on the WHO's uh, WHA72 portal. Um, so they do upload documents on a regular basis. So I don't know uh, when all of them will be uploaded, but certainly before the start of the assembly. And I would just kind of check on a regular basis to see um, if there are documents uploaded there. Uh, we also did receive a question about if there are holidays. I know last year during WHA there was a holiday and a lot of the businesses were closed. That holiday was actually tied to a religious calendar. Um, so uh, to my knowledge, that holiday is now after uh, WHA this year. So there shouldn't be any closures uh, during WHA, hopefully. Um, but yeah, that was just, I wanted to, to clear that up. Um, and then as far as the survey that we'll be sending out to members, um, on our uh, WHA statement on WHO reform. Uh, we will be sending that around next week to our members. So um, please stay tuned for that. Um, and it'll be sent to, to all of our members' contacts. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and close out the webinar. And thank you again for, uh, to all of our presenters today for sharing, uh, again, their intel uh, and tips and tricks to navigate WHA. And also thank you to our participants for um, submitting your questions and comments. And if you do have, uh, continue to have questions, please do email them to events at globalhealth.org. Uh, a reminder that our next pre-WHA webinar and our final webinar will take place on May 10th at 9 a.m., so two weeks from now. Um, and so thank you again and enjoy the rest of your Friday.